We are returning to look at some additional pieces of sculpture, in, uh, including Ernst Barlach. Uh, this is his Avenger, the Avenger. Uh, he was a German sculptor, and he can be linked with the German Expressionists. His um, style emerged uh, being out of influences from uh, German medieval sculpture, and I have to assume that would have been partly wood, because Barlock himself did carve in wood. And even the bronze casting here does, at least to me, suggest the broad planes that you would find in wood carving, or that you could find in wood carving. Uh, he also made a trip to Russia in the early 20th century, and was influenced by stylistic elements of sculpture that he saw on his visit. Uh, so it is a blending, <coughs> excuse me, a blending of sources. Uh, he did draw on peasant types, very strong and sturdy. He creates images, almost moving kinetic, uh, that have flowing robes, uh, very sturdy, very big, broad planes. And in this case, a kind of thrust moving forward. This was done in 1914. That's at the beginning of World War I. Barlock, like a lot of German artists at this time period, was a nationalist, and he supported uh, the Germans, and he supported the German army. Uh, this is intended as a representation of the, the power of the, the war machine, essentially, of the military, of the army uh, in Germany. He is very quickly, and this is going to be true of other artists as well, very quickly going to turn away from support for war and become an artist who documents the pain and suffering that World War I, that any war could in fact inflict. Uh, this is the object that we have in our textbook. Uh, it is located on page 9, <coughs> excuse me, 918, um, and it is a war monument uh, that Barlock uh, created uh, to commemorate the losses of World War uh, I, in fact. Uh, it was uh, originally located in Cologne Cathedral, and the date I have for it is uh, 1927. Uh, it was uh, condemned as degenerate by the Nazis, and I would like you to take a look at page 918 in our textbook, which does deal with a degenerate art in uh, the rule of Hitler and under the Reich, essentially. Uh, the Nazis demanded that art be both naturalistic and ideal. <clears throat> Anything that did not meet uh, those criteria uh, was considered to be offensive and uh, threatening. So uh, the artists were not allowed to practice, and in many cases the artworks were destroyed. Uh, the image that we're looking at here uh, was, and I think you can get a, a glimpse of that on the right, originally placed over a tomb, and it had a panel, a marker, uh, that indicated that it was for everyone, 1914 to 1918, uh, to commemorate uh, the dead, uh, the lives that had been lost in that war. Uh, again, we have uh, flowing robes in our figure, very strong planes, clear outlines too, which is uh, typical of Barlock, a reduction of details, and very strong human emotions conveyed through uh, pose and expression. And in this case, uh, the pose, I'm going to call it kind of floating, uh, floating in air, as if we're looking at a spiritual figure, a ghostly emanation, as if to suggest the loss of life from each of the dead coming out of the First World War. It's kind of a haunting figure, and it focuses on loss rather than commemorating heroic action, which war memorials usually do. Uh, as a result of that, this piece was condemned as degenerate by the Nazis. Uh, it was actually one of the versions. One was hidden. So one of the casts was protected, and it is from that protected cast that we were able to get a replica in place in Cologne Cathedral today. Uh, however, the one that was there at the time of the rise of the Nazis was actually melted down uh, for purposes of turning it into ammunition. Uh, this is a, a closer look. Uh, the, the one that's just the head is a study uh, that Barlock was creating. And I think it shows you he was working with peasant types, people who were sturdy, who were farmers, who worked the land. 
um, very broad shouldered and simplified in terms of their forms, but very powerful uh, in terms of the expression and the pose that he's giving them. Uh, a figure hauntingly floating uh, above the tomb and referencing a sense of loss, not a sense of heroism. The next group of artists we're going to be looking at, the Dadaists, are going to receive the heaviest hammer from the censorship that comes from the Nazis. Before we can get there, though, I need to give you a little bit of a background on Dada. Uh, Dada is a movement uh, variously dated, but I'm going to pick 1916 to 1922, that arises in Europe in reaction to the atrocities, the violence, the blood of World War I. It begins, in other words, as a protest movement by young people your age, students, writers, poets, artists, thinkers, who had had enough. And they create an art form that exists in reaction to a society that they feel allowed such horrible warfare to take place. So they give this society an art form that they think is appropriate that is in fact anti-art, non-art, and attacks all of the ideas and values of such a society. In other words, it's only the absurdity of war that could come from the absurd society that allows it to exist. So what the Dadaists are doing is saying essentially, in your face, here's some absurd art, here's some anti-art. I'd like to at least show you one of the battles, probably one of the premier battles that helped to prompt Dada, and it was the Battle of Verdun. Um, it lasts for uh, an extended period, February to December 1916, and I'd like you to get just a look at what the photos uh, show us, uh, reveal about what happened today. Um, in this battle, uh, 306,000 individuals died that we know of, and a half a million men were wounded. Uh, there were about 40 million artillery shells fired, and if you look upper left, that's what the land looks like there today. And it is a monument. You can go and visit it. You can also see the endless crosses in the fields. When you could identify the remains of the dead, they were eventually buried on site uh, by their uh, country of origin. The photo at the left um, is a photo uh, that was taken by the Germans. So this is the German side essentially doing the photography. And the two images on the right are of a couple of the remaining bunkers that still stand at Verdun. Uh, Verdun symbolically represents the atrocities of World War I, uh, the horrors of trench warfare, which is how this was fought. Uh, you fight, you die for a, a few yards of ground uh, that you've dug into. For those of you who might have seen the movie 1917, that'll give you a little bit of a sense of what this was actually like. It will foster Okay. It will foster the Dadaist movement in Europe. And um, that movement, which is anti-war, it is a protest uh, movement, will come to the United States under the auspices of, of the works of Marcel Duchamp, who is no longer creating work that is an art protest. I'll address that in just a moment. But before we get to Duchamp and his works, I'd like to let you know how important this stuff really is. And I know you're looking at it and you're going, say what? Uh, but regardless of the quality of the works of art as you perceive them on the screen right now, let me point out what's important about them for the future. They are going to heavily influence surrealism. That's point number one. Particularly the chance combination of things often out of context or juxtaposed. Things that don't go together naturally are placed together in an irrational way. Okay, so one, it influences surrealism. Two, it's going to promote the idea as art rather than the object. And this is going to result in a whole group of new art movements and ideas in the 20th century in particular and continuing today. Marcel Duchamp, in terms of the works on the screen right now, and both of those are by Marcel Duchamp, would tell you those are not art. The idea to create them, that was the art. So that's one of the legacies of Marcel Duchamp. Okay, and number three, 
Duchamp uses ordinary objects, and he helps to maybe continue what Picasso started, but certainly he is more effective in promoting the acceptability of new materials and new techniques uh, in the 20th century, and he's going to be very, very important for that. And these materials are going to be ordinary things. Okay, the objects that we have on the screen right now, both of them come from the Philadelphia Museum of Art, which has the world's largest and best collection of works by Marcel Duchamp. That does include his famous, now infamous, fountain, figure 2926 on the left, and also his bicycle wheel and stool, which is located on your right. Uh, Duchamp will come to New York City, and he will be escaping the turbulence of the war when he comes. He is going to bring Dada with him, but it's not going to be a protest to war. Instead, it's going to be really a direct challenge to middle-class values and ideas. Uh, we tended to think of ourselves as liberal. Uh, Duchamp did not see that, and I think that is very clear. In the fountain, which uh, he created the original in 1917, uh, and I think uh, there's no one fooled that it's a fountain. Everyone knows it's a urinal, which has been flipped on its side. Given a fake signature, R. Mutt, and dated 1917. Okay, what's the story with this? There was in New York City an unjuried art show, and Duchamp decided to test how liberal we Americans actually were by entering this as a work of art. The work Fountain, as he titled it, was in fact actually rejected proving Duchamp's point that America, in fact, was not as liberal as it claimed, and not as open in terms of the world of art. Okay, what is an unjuried art show? An unjuried art show is a show that accepts everything. You show up, you give them your work of art, even if it's terrible, and they accept it. Nevertheless, they rejected the fountain by Duchamp. Uh, what is the fountain by Duchamp? It is a ready-made object that has been mass produced, that was created, um, Duchamp would say, and others would say as well, uh, by random chance. Uh, suddenly the idea came to him, ah, let's flip it on its side. Let's sign it, our mutt, and let's date it, uh, 1917. Uh, by doing this also, he is producing things that are no longer useful. He has turned them away from their original use. He also, at the same time, would never say this is a work of art. What he would claim was the work of art was the idea in his head, the artist's idea to create this. The same is too true for Bicycle, Wheel, and Stool, which is described as a rectified ready-made that means two objects mass-produced off the assembly line. Duchamp puts together, he changes them, or he rectifies them, placing them by random chance in connection with each other, rendering both of them, by the way, totally and completely useful, useless, but creating uh, a new object that is literally a rectified ready-made. He would again argue it's not a work of art, um, it is uh, instead uh, the idea that came to him by random chance to create this. This um, is a photograph of a right of the original uh, fountain that Marcel Duchamp created. As soon as it was rejected from the art show, it had served its purpose, and Duchamp took it and trundled down to Alfred Stieglitz's studio, where Stieglitz took this photograph in 1917. At that point, uh, Duchamp got rid of, uh, threw away the fountain, quote-unquote, and it was never seen again. What you're looking at in the museums today, and that's going to include this one, in the Philadelphia Museum of Art, um, include uh, replicas that were authenticated by the artist before he died. A gallery owner approached him and said, hey, you know all those ready-mades that you had in your early career? Couldn't we make editions, limited editions? You sign the edition and we sell them so that the works can, in fact, continue. Uh, Marcel Duchamp agreed to that. So the objects that you're looking at generally speaking, not all of them, but generally, were replicas created in the 1960s. Th these come from the, the early period um, uh, in the teens of Duchamp's working career.
Okay, let me take us back. Uh, just some more stuff to look at. Uh, two more very Dada pieces, and I believe both of these in the, are in the Philly Museum of Art. The one in the middle, it's a glass jar. I kind of love that one uh, because it's called French Air. Duchamp brought it back from France with him. He was originally French, spending much time in the United States, however. Uh, and when he brought it here, he said, eh, it has French air in it. Uh, the lower right slide is of a coat rack, which Duchamp took by random chance, ready-made, and rectified it by nailing it to the floor, making it, again, not usable, but giving it a new name. And I hope I have the right name for this. Uh, I think it's Trebuchet, and I think. I don't play chess, so I can't tell you for sure. Uh, I do believe it references a chess move. And uh, Marcel Duchamp was an avid chess player. Uh, the photograph of Marcel Duchamp up in the upper left corner, uh, he did not take that. Another artist did. The reason it would appeal to Duchamp is that the smoke would rise up on its own by random chance and could not be controlled, which is an important element of Dada. Duchamp uh, had a number of followers, uh, and let me tell you, they were so intimately attached to Marcel Duchamp. I think groupies is a more uh, appropriate term. One of them is Man Ray. Man Ray, that's a shortened version of his real name, Emmanuel Radnitsky, uh, is from Philadelphia. Originally, he was born in Philly, so I'm claiming him as ours. He did work with Duchamp in the 1920s, uh, creating uh, works of art that were Dada in nature and in spirit. And he seemed to have taken to Dada uh, very quickly and very readily. Uh, the work that's in our book, 3020, which is called Gift, is located on the left. And it, it is, again, a ready-made object. It is an iron, an old flat iron. You'd have to heat by putting it on hot coals, probably. Uh, normally, it would be used to smooth stuff. But in this case, what Man Ray has done, and he would claim by random chance, was to take tacks and glue them to the surface of the iron, thus making the iron a threatening object. And by applying the name gift to it, even creepier and more threatening. There is an element with some Dada material and it will carry over to surrealism, uh, that introduces something fearsome, some, something threatening, and something perhaps uh, damaging or destructive. Uh, that would apply to, and this again also is a replica uh, that was created this time in the 1950s, it was 1958, that it was made after a 1921 original. Uh, it does qualify in our text illicit basically is a Dada piece. Man Ray, however, is going to continue working in the realm of, I'm going to call it fantasy, Dada, and surrealism. And the photograph that we have on the right is a later surrealist Man Ray photograph that is called Glass Tears. Again, it places things out of context. In this case, glass beads on the face of a woman who is kind of creepy looking if you look at the heavily mascaraed eyelashes, eyelashes that she has. Um, this particular photograph belongs then to the world of surrealism, uh, which places objects out of context, juxtaposes them uh, by random chance, continuing some of the basic ideas of Dada. Why I showed it to you? Uh, because it's the first photograph to sell at auction, I believe, for over a million bucks. Uh, this particular photograph is a limited edition. It was vintage. In other words, Man Ray himself created it. And uh, it is uh, a sign of the times indicating that, in fact, photography has arrived and is now accepted within the world of art.